Hello everyone, thanks for being here today. We are at New Year's Eve. Now I understand that probably I'm not gonna have as big of an audience today live and that's okay because I know that you know where to find us on YouTube and Spotify and some other podcast channels. But the information that we have today will I think be worth the search. So before we go much further, let's introduce who we have with us today. You wanna go ahead? Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. Um, my name is Casey Haston, and I am an executive recruiter, and I'm also the director of recruiting with VIP. It's a company that's specializing mainly in the accounting and finance space, um, placing either correct contract, contract to hire, direct hire roles, and we also have a project management solutions group. Well, welcome. We thought that it would be a good idea if, if we think of the new year as new beginnings, new year, possibly a new job for some of our parents. And so wh who better than you to come and talk to our parents about what it's like to be in the job market and, um, and, and you know, just some of the, the things that give them a leg up in their next job search. So why don't you start off a little bit about how's the market looking these days? The market is looking fantastic. We are probably at one of our lowest points of unemployment um, in a very long time, especially, I think the last time I checked, um, overall unemployment was 3.5%, but in the accounting and finance space, we're at 1.5%. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really low. And so it's very, you know, finding contractors and stuff like that, um, it's pretty tough because people can kind of pick what they want. But just because you can pick what you want doesn't mean you're gonna get that job. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I have a lot of people that reach out to me that have been unemployed in the accounting and finance sector for maybe a year. And you have to ask yourself why. And so that's where, you know, you want to be coaching those people to really have them think about what's happening during the interview process that you're not getting a job offer. Okay, so let's sort of go backwards before we go forward. And you have spent over 20 years in the accounting space and you worked with charter schools. I did work with charter schools. That's why when they uh, asked me to come on your show, I was like, oh, you're kidding me. She is a superintendent of a charter school. So what I did was for 11 years, I worked for a very small company. And we targeted, we, we actually wrote charters. I, I really was a jack of all trades there. But, you know, the accounting and finance was my specialty, more the accounting. And um, we targeted charter schools that had 588 or less. So you know those schools are struggling yes. with their funding because yes. that's really tough. And they probably can't afford to hire a true accountant, right? right? And so they're hiring bookkeepers and high school kids to come through their books. And you know when it comes to reporting to TEA, the Texas Education yeah. Agency, man, if you... They don't play. Oh, no. And if you report that you paid a regular ed teacher with special ed funds, you're in trouble at the end of the year. Our job was to keep them out of trouble at the end of the year. And so we would go in once a month and monitor their accounts and their accounting. And we also did most of their filing with TEA. Well, I think that's so neat. That you, <laughs> you really sort of know us inside and out. I do. I do. And so let's talk about how do you know when it's time to switch careers? How, how, what, what signs are there? Well, I'm going to give you a personal experience. So when the company that I worked for for 11 years closed down, um, I had to find another job and I had not been without a job since I was like 14 right so I'm panicking and I start meeting with recruiters never had met with recruiters before so I had no idea how this whole process worked and um, met with a lot of not so good ones before I got to my good one and this good one kept saying well what about this job you know and this is the very glaring one but sometimes it's not so glaring but she said what about this job and I'm like no that's too much of this you know and it was all accounting related and what she finally told me was, Casey, you don't like accounting. <laughs> and I went, oh, what am I going to do? And so she's like, I really think that you could be a good recruiter. And I'm like, uh, I, I don't work on commission. No, I'm not a used car salesman. 
and here I am almost seven years later and now I'm a director of recruiting so but what I love about that is that she recognized that I wasn't happy doing what I'd been doing for 20 years and she gave me an avenue to go find a new position and a new life and I have to tell you I don't work a day in my life right now because I love what I do so much so if parents if some of our parents are hating having to go to work or hating that just really n not doing their best at work is that is that sort of a sign absolutely I mean I, I tell people all the time you need to find what you're passionate about and I think we'll talk about some tips on that later but um, if you you know I love what Jeff says about people that work here at Real News PR thank God it's Monday if you do not love what you do and love going to work and the people that you work with you need to make a change because you're not making it you're not helping anybody be better by doing that now one thing I will say this is the best advice I can give you. Don't leave a job without having a job. And a lot of people will make that mistake. Mm -hmm. You're way more employable if you have a job when you go to find that next job. You were making me think of, there's a great line. I heard it once, I never forgot it. Don't be, don't be that person that left a job but didn't leave. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that's, because um, sometimes we have, um, um, I've, and I've heard this used not so much in the school business, but with when I, because I'm actually do talk to people who aren't in the school business, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, don't be that person who retired but forgot to leave. Yeah, that's good. That's good so stuff. Those are the good lines, um, because we y every once in a while you do run against that person who who is not happy at work, but they're not doing anything to forward themselves and go somewhere else and do something they they want to do. Absolutely. And I think it's important that you find that right culture fit as you're looking at those new jobs. I'm just, it is so huge that everybody is on board. And I know people say that's impossible, but it's not. I think you can, you can create, if it comes from the top down, that culture where everybody can be happy and be, thank God it's Monday. Well, you know, we write, I write the Monday Post. Every, I sit in my chair, it's on my calendar on Sunday, and I find a positive picture and I write about what's upcoming and, and that we get to go back to work on Monday. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I, I'm totally there. I love going to work. Um, so how do you prepare for a new job? I, are, there, are there physical things? Are there mental things? What, what, ha, what's, what has to happen for one to successfully find a new job? Okay, so to successfully find a new job, first of all, you've got to get your mindset right because if you are bringing baggage with you from your current job that you're not happy at, that's going to show in your interview process. So get your mind clear. Don't, and kind of like you said, leave it behind. You know, don't bring the negativity and the toxicity that you may be experiencing right now to that next role. Um, when you go into your interview, well, let's, let's start before you go into your interview. What are you going to wear? You know? I'm, are you going to wear jeans and flip-flops? I've seen that at job fairs for teachers. Yeah. No. No. Dress for success. I know that's an old cliche saying, but it really is It's a serious thing. And I'll tell you, I had, and I learned how important this was at one point because I had a candidate, and this was back when, when I first started recruiting, that went to um, meet with one of my clients. And my client called me afterwards, and they're like, um, Casey, did you talk to her about dress code? And I was like, no, because I didn't think I had to, which was a rookie mistake on my part. She showed up in jeans and flip-flops for a job interview. So you can't do that because she was definitely, she had the qualifications for that role. She was definitely passed over because she did not present professionally. Is that something you were able to share with her afterwards? Yes, absolutely. I provide that feedback so that it, we call it a coaching moment so that she doesn't make that mistake again. And now the first thing I ask my candidates when I call to prep them for their interview the next day, have you picked out what you're going to wear yet? Yeah, hint, hint. Yeah, and when they tell me, and I, if, if I don't like it, I'm like, oh, but maybe you should consider this. You know, let's not wear that bright purple shirt. Let's put on a more calm blue shirt or even a white shirt, you know, because first impressions. Uh, does every job need a resume? Yes. You know, it's funny you should say that. Back 20 years ago, when we were um, not so sophisticated, teachers didn't need a resume. Teachers did not need a resume huh. to apply for a teaching job. But now it's it's expected. Matter of fact, a lot of teachers come with portfolios oh, wow. of their work and, and maybe professional development they've done, uh, awards they may have won, or recognitions, pictures of their kids, some best practices they, they may have done. I think that's really smart that they do that. Um, one thing that 
and you mentioned pictures, so I just want to throw this out on the resumes. Don't put your picture on your resume. Uh, we're seeing that trend right now, mm -hmm. and the reason I say don't do that is because it can lead to discrim discrimination. Yeah, sure. And, and, or, and you may not even know it, but it, lead, it can lead to a bias on other people's parts. So please don't put your pictures on your resumes. Yeah, uh, you were talking about portfolios, or you're saying that it's good that they do that. I'm part of the Miss Asia World board, and they do a competition every two years. And one of the things that we have them do when they apply is to do bring us a resume. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, a portfolio. A portfolio of that that's a reflection of themselves. And because what we tell them is, if we can get you to, to start sort of bragging on yourself, you know, looking at your accomplishments in a way that many people and females in some cultures are encouraged not to, you know, mm -hmm. not to highlight themselves, not to, um, not to uh, show the good things, to showcase themselves. Right. They're, they're discouraged from doing that. So we're having to, um, in some, with some different cultures, help females understand it's, that's, this is the time to do that to not only uh, are we giving you permission, but we're telling you it's a perfectly acceptable practice to showcase yourself when you're applying for a job. And so part of the, the competition requirements is that they turn in a portfolio that we encourage them to continue adding to after the competition so that they can use it for job interviews. That is awesome. I love that idea. Uh, so not only then do they need a resume, but be thinking about how they can showcase themselves through a portfolio. Exactly. And another tip that I would give on a resume, because, I mean, you got to think, I look at hundreds of resumes a day, and I look at them for about two seconds each. Chances are the employer, if you're applying directly to them, we call it the black hole, um, they are getting probably thousands of applicants, most of whom are not qualified for that role, and it's a beating to go through them, right? So they're looking at them very, very quickly. So you really want to have the information you want to convey at the top. If you have a degree, at the top. If you have a, um, you know, a certification, like if you're a CPA for me, that's one of the things I look for, at the top. And then, as you're, the other little trick that I will tell you, if, as you're listing your dates for your role, um, if you have progressed in your role, like say you're a staff accountant, you progressed to a senior accountant, don't list those dates twice over here on the very right hand side for those of you not listing I'm making lots of hand gestures or not watching I'm making lots of hand gestures um, you want to list the name of the company first the full range of dates that you were there and make that right justified and then list your progression below but you're going to put the dates inside right next to the title so it doesn't draw the eye to it as much okay, okay? and the reason we do that is because we, w we want to really draw their attention to the fact of how long you've been there total and not make you look like a job hopper. And I will tell you, as somebody who looks at resumes, mostly during the early summer, you know, summer when we have openings, we look at that. We, if you job hopped, if you had a, a job gap, yep, uh, we, we very seriously look at that. Um, that is not something that we, um, Especially if we have many people applying, we're just not going to call yeah. you. We're just not. I mean, it's uh, not when we have all these other candidates. And and something else that I noticed that in our world, you have Indeed.com and Monster and so forth, mm -hmm. and maybe your own platform. We have the Region 10 Teacher Job Network where we ask okay. people to apply. And we are very specific in our requirements that Texas Education Agency is very specific in who can teach. Yep. And so if you don't have a bachelor's if in, in some areas, if you don't have certification, all of that, right? And, and we will put something up and just get a wide range of people who apply for everything. And they probably do it multiple times. Oh, my gosh, yeah. We do <laughs> see names. We do see names yeah. uh, over time. Um, that, and, and it's like, so this is a good opportunity to remind people uh, future job seekers to understand that especially in this job market yes um, all of this counts absolutely and that's another thing people say should I apply to a job if I don't meet all the requirements no you should not I'm, I promise <laughs> you the only thing you're doing is annoying the hiring manager and and that's 
that's a good point. Yeah. Because it, it's, it is annoying. When we get 37 resumes for one job and, you know, three of them yes. meet the qualification. Hey, you're lucky if you're getting three of them <laughs> through those online. Well, it depends. Of course, it depends <laughs> on, on if some jobs are harder to find. That's why I have to go to Puerto Rico and, and Spain to recruit bilingual teachers and, and Spanish teachers. But um, some of our uh, special ed, matter of fact, special ed is very, very difficult right now to find. And, and especially if you need bilingual. Yeah. So it's it sounds like we have some of the similar problems. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the test. I know in Region 10, every applicant has to take the Conexa. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, I don't know, I call it a psych test, uh, if you have a better word. But talk about why candidates should take that and, and what kind of information do companies get from it? So, so Conexa itself, I'm not real sure what that one entails and what all it tests, but I can talk to you about my sure. assessment mm -hmm. that I use. And I've, I'm, a, I'm an assessment junkie. I'm just going to go ahead and admit that right now. Um, I take any assessment that I can get my hands on that's not too expensive. Um, but I was looking for a tool for hiring within our organization, um, and I finally landed on one. It's called the FIT test. It's by iWorkZone. And um, this one I really love because it measures across four different quadrants. And just very quickly, um, it measures your external, so like your Myers-Briggs type um, mm -hmm. behaviors. Then it measures your active versus passive, which tells us whether or not you're gonna be able to sit still or whether your brain's always talking to you. Um, the third one is your task versus people. And there's no right or wrong here, right? It's just, do you prefer to get the task done? Or do you prefer to, do you focus more on people than the task? And so, um, and then the final one is the one that's so, so important, and that's your internal wiring. And that's how you, um, it's just how you are born. And they have found, you know, with almost certainty that unless you have a major life event, that internal wiring's not going to change. It's just not. And usually, in the example that he used on my podcast the other day, Jeff Yates being he, um, was that they will see, like, if somebody has a loss, a family loss, member, tragic, whatever, People will change to be more realistic, which is where you ask why. But eventually, maybe a year, two years later, they're going to go back to their natural wiring. So hmm. I use this for determining whether somebody's going to be good at what we do, which is sales, basically. We just, our product has a brain. Um, but this, you can use this as an individual as well. And in fact, I encourage you to. I don't think there's a charge for it as an individual. Um, if you go to www.iworkzone.com, there's there's three different areas, um, but there's one for students and one for uh, job seekers, and they also have jobs posted on there. So that'd be another way to find a job. Oh, okay. And, but what's great is the information you get out of there is what are you going to love to do? So it's like a career inventory? Absolutely. And, and so we encourage parents to go ahead and take that yes. because it tells them that maybe they might not be in the right job right now. It certainly told me that. And so when I took the assessment, when I was just uh, checking it out to see if I was going to use it, it was so funny because I am I, I'm definitely entrepreneurial, right? Okay, do you see many entrepreneurial accountants? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so Jeff was reading, going through my results, and he's like, man, you are right where you need to be. You're in sales. This is great. You're looking at that big picture. You're not into the details. Hello, accountant. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so he was like, this is exactly what you need to be doing. And he said, he said yeah, you would have not been happy if you'd been doing something like accounting. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, guess what I did for 20 years? And he's like, oh, please, God, don't tell me you were an accountant. I was like, yeah, I was. So we want parents to find out sooner rather than later, not yes. wait 20 years. Yes. Um, and because we want to make sure that um, we use our time wisely and, and already, you know, we're Flies. almost at 20 minutes. Wow. Let's uh, talk a little bit about how our parents can prepare their children for careers and for to be hired and the reason that's important to me is because we are college and career readiness school mm -hmm. we're that's how we're labeled and so we do a lot with that college thing uh, we have college and career counselors and, and dual credit and dual credit MOUs with the colleges so we got that covered but we also want to prepare them for college and one of the ways that we do that is we give them grades starting in sixth grade on the soft career skills of um, uh, Sam blanking out collaboration, communication, 
uh, oral and written presentation skills, self-efficacy, you know, agency, mm -hmm. work ethic, and so forth. So what what can parents do to help us and, and uh, you know, prepare them for a job at home during the school years? I think, and, you know, you would think that I'm getting paid or I was an affiliate for iWorkZone, and I'm not. Um, but I think that going back to that, figure out where your kid's passion is so they can be successful in life. I was not unsuccessful as an accountant, but I wasn't. I, I could have been so much better doing what I'm doing now, right? So there is um, a, a section on there for students, and I did verify um, that you can start using um, this assessment at the age of 13. Wow. And then I would test them again a little bit later during those formative years, you know, maybe about 15, 16. But start figuring out where their passion lies now so you can start kind of herding them into that path. You know, I was herded into a path and I went because my mom told me I had to, you know? And it, it turned out not to be my passion. So what I'm hearing you say is that we should encourage parents to have their kids take this. Mm -hmm. we, we might uh, be able to f do that at the schools as well. If we do it at the schools, then we want to get the information to the parents so the parents can begin that conversation. Absolutely. You know, I'm always about trying to get parents and kids to talk more to each other. Yes. Especially in the teen years. <laughs> And so <laughs> let me know how that works out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, giving them a basis of, um, a, you know, foundation to talk around what the kids seem to be scoring in. And, and can you give some examples of skills that might uh, th that might come up um, in, that, in that assessment? Well, OK, I can tell you what mine look like and what mm -hmm. I look for when I'm hiring. Um, mine was very I'm artistic. I'm uh, creative. Um, I can't remember what the other one is, but there's three things that make me very entrepreneurial, very big picture. Also, when you look at my um, my external, I'm highly, highly competitive, which means I need to win. At the end of the day, I need to win. But I'm also high. I'm not as high on people, but I've got that high social. So what that means is I like to win as a team is what that tells us. OK. And because I'm so entrepreneurial. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. going to try to say that word again. I, I'm that. Doing, yeah, that. Since I am that way, I tend to um, do better in areas where I kind of get to be my own boss and I get to drive things forward, but there's a reward at the end. So with me, I'm 100% commissioned, believe it or not, now. Oh. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, you eat what you kill when you do that. And I love that. <laughs> I'm right where I need to be, you know? <laughs> I love that, you know, if I don't go out there and if I don't get this next client or this, find this next candidate, I'm not going to make any money. And I'm not okay with that. Mm -hmm. So, And it's not about the money. It's about the winning because I want I want to be number one, you know. So I think those are some of the skills. And, you know, we can talk a little bit more about that when I get you set up with Jeff. But it definitely, and it will give you a list of careers once you take this that you would be good at. Mm -hmm. And sales was my number one, believe it or not. Wow. Not accounting. <laughs> So other, other things that parents can do as far as uh, helping kids with behaviors and so forth, what, what, what are behavior expectations in the workplace that parents can start helping us with? Teach your kids to be on time, number one. Um, don't give them this mindset that whatever they want to do is okay, because it's not. Once you get in the workforce, you're going to have to answer to someone. Unless you own your own company, you're always going to be answering to someone else. And one of the biggest things that I'm seeing, and I'm not, I don't want to pick on millennials, but I'm going to, is there's no regard for schedules. And it's a real issue. And um, I think that it's because, and I'm sorry, parents, but it's because you've taught them that they just need to be safe and they need to that they can, if, they're, if they don't feel safe going to bed at 8, then they can go to bed at 8.30. And I think that that's where we're doing that generation a real disservice. Well, w I have been reading that colleges, for example, have to have safe spaces and more counselors and social workers because kids just don't have the coping skills mm -hmm. um, because they've been protected so much. Yeah. And we've actually had reports of um, parents of adult children calling the workplace to make excuses for their children. Yeah, I've seen that too, and it's not okay. Yeah, that's um, so. What I'm hearing you say is we have to revert back to some of those old, more uh, old-fashioned behaviors of coming to work on time, dressing professionally, acting professionally, mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and respecting each other's space. And, you know, and one final thing that I will tell people, and I think this is something that I've, it took me a long time to learn too, but, I mean, if you're doing what you know you're supposed to be doing, don't wor worry about what other people think. It's none of your business. You need to stay, and I do this, I call it the hula hoop theory. Stay in your hula hoop. Don't worry about what's outside of it. So, so don't um, get caught in the gossip thing at, in the... Uh, in the lunch room exactly stay in your hula hoop and you know I was you know growing up I was a redhead with very bright freckles and so I got picked on a lot and it really bothered me and that carried forward a lot into adulthood so not the same confident person you see here today that's not who I was when I was growing up it took me a long time to overcome that and so I think if you learn at an early age not to pay attention to the haters, I don't know what else to call them, the bullies, mm -hmm. learn now, because it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what they think about you. And that's, that's, a, that's an excellent suggestion to have help parents help us with that. We, um, you know, we have children, and, and children, especially, I'll give you an example, third grade boys mm -hmm. tend to be physical. They tend to hit and, and bump and you know, knock over chairs accidentally. They don't mean it. They just, they're, they're learning to work their bodies. Um, and so having parents understand that that's age appropriate behavior and it's how the adults around react to that hitting or, or silly behavior will let that child know whether it's worth it to do that again. Exactly. And so when, when a school is allowed to uh, have a consequence for a child hitting another child and the parent doesn't come to protect th the hitter, then the hitter tends not to want to hit again in the future. Exactly. And so those are some of the things that we're um, reminding parents that that, that hitting thing, it, uh, lying, lying is age appropriate. It's how the adults react to the lying that lets the child know whether to do that, to keep doing that. And so let's not protect the kids from lying, whether a three in third grade or whether in the workplace. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, we still see that today in the workplace. And it's just, yeah. it's unfortunate. People who can't be self-accountable, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's an interesting dilemma. And we, we are seeing it in our adults, the, the lack of self-accountability. It's... Um, it's it's taking special skills uh, for the supervisors to work with that. I know that's probably a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge for me, and I'm not you know I'm not leading a big school. I have a small sales team, but I'm still. If you think about it, think about like more of me in a room. It, it can get pretty aggressive sometimes with all, and we all have that same competitive nature. Right. We all want to win, and so I call it herding cats. Well. I've used that term. <laughs> uh, we're we're almost to the end of our podcast, so let's talk a little bit about your um, website that you okay. have and the pieces to it. You've got it's kchaston.com, correct? And you've got a blog on there. You've got podcasts on there. Talk talk a little bit of what what's on there. Well, I think one of the things that I am so proud of this year is really changing my mindset and g targeting those things. And you know, I started writing down my goals and started stepping them back and having micro goals and baby goals along the way that helped me get to my goals. And I was so proud because one of my goals was to launch my personal brand this year and by the end of Q2. And on June 3rd, my website went live. Okay. So yeah. I was really proud of that. But the goal of this is not really, you know, everybody kept saying, what's your call to action? What's your call to action? I said, my call to action is to give back. I'm giving value to my community, right? And so I'm tracking like my journey to personal branding in real time. And every time I have a fall or something weird happens, I'm going to blog about it so that you know that that's normal, wherever you are in your stage of personal branding. Um, I also do a blog on building better teams because that's what I do. I build teams. Um, but probably my favorite thing, I'm a podcast junkie too, assessment junkie, podcast junkie. It could be a lot of junkies, right? <laughs> um, but my, um, the podcast junkie is not about the pod, or not about my podcast, but I do talk about, and I'm trying to hurry here, I know we're running out of time. I do talk about when you are in the right job, that support will come to you. I mean, when I pitched the idea of a podcast to my company, and I said, I'll use my network, I'll use my thought leaders that I've met, I will bring you everything you need. I just want you to pay for it. They said, yes. 
How many? Oh. Uh -oh. How many companies would do that? You know. Well, and you've got one, and I've got one. Exactly. <laughs> but it's very forward thinking on your part. That's when we were talking earlier. I was like, you know, why are you doing this? Well, because uh, there's so much negative um, publicity for public education out there, and this gives us a chance to shine the light on the very positive things going on in public education, and and our school stakeholder and you're you're now a school stakeholder you're helping our parents learn about how to have a better chance at landing a better job absolutely so um, you didn't know it but you asked me a question so thank <laughs> you for that <laughs> uh, sometimes we get a chance to do that so thank you for being on here let's um, let's make sure that we continue the relationship especially around the tool for um, the career interest yes I think that for both our parents and our students it's important that they figure out early so that they're not like you. And, and I didn't talk about me, but I had a, a life change moment also. Uh, I was an engineering assistant. And so, um, well, everybody in the family is teachers. I wasn't going to be a teacher. <laughs> and then I wasn't going to be a principal. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so um, let's, let's see if we can get them to find their passion earlier than we did. I think that's so critical. So thank you. Thanks thank for you. being here. Thank you for tuning in to the Ask Dr. Be Good show. For more information on Legacy Preparatory Charter Schools, visit our website, LegacyPCA.com, or call 469-249-1099. And remember to like us on Facebook, where we stream live weekly Tuesdays at 3 p.m.